Good morning, folks. We've got a number of stories to hit today, including science mysteries and important discoveries that help frame our usual topics of coverage. But we are starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last day on the sun was relatively quiet. Just minor coronal motions, relatively calm bright active regions which are not flaring at the moment, and the northern polar coronal hole. We'll come quickly to the solar wind to see a slight intensification this morning up top in red and the black lines. It's being driven mostly by the interplanetary magnetic field shift as you see the blue panel below it swerving across the magnetic angles within the plasma stream. No geomagnetic unrest from it yet, but the solar wind pressure is approaching those minor thresholds, with more on the way. In 211 angstroms, we can see that the northern coronal hole is actually a major trans-equatorial extension. This is part of the solar polar magnetic reversal within sunspot maximum. Coronal holes race to the other side before the sunspots do. That solar wind will arrive in about two days. Also want to take a quick look at the sunspots over the last day. We'll look at both northern groups here to find the sunspot crossing central longitudes towards the departing limb is in major decay, losing nearly all its umbra overnight. While they got picked up at the trailing spot, large lumbering active region getting some company at the caboose. Development there can flare within hours, so we'll need to monitor closely. And we're off to cosmology. Folks, what's harder than putting your eggs in the third place candidate to replace wimp dark matter basket behind axions and sterile neutrinos? Finding absolutely zero signals or indications of their existence, just like every other dark matter search in history. Interesting bit of solar forcing here, and it's a double using Mars. It not only describes how sunlight exposure in sunspot minimum conditions versus maximum work the atmosphere, but perhaps more importantly, they recognize the coupling between lower and upper atmosphere via the non-migrating tides. The same kind of atmospheric tides can be found on Earth, and in our climate models, those don't rapidly translate solar forcing downward. In case you forget, the field is currently looking for ways to explain the lower atmospheric rapid forcing of space weather. Maybe, uh, look here. Up next, fun watching a truckload of the world's best scientists come together for a paper with the word mysterious in the title. Then you read the first sentence and that they are reporting the discovery of a unique object of unknown nature and you're geared for a doozy. Turns out they're suggesting it's not really an object, but that the stellar production in the region is spitting out dust sporadically, irregularly, in a fit of repeating anger every 20 days or so. Their discovery of a nearby binary indicates accretion boom scenario, not necessarily so mysterious, but well done on that mechanism. We are off to climate to close as we transition with what is actually one of the first solid confirmations that the Little Ice Age 400 years ago during the last grand solar minimum and volcano surge on Earth did indeed affect the entire planet. It was not just the northern hemisphere. In terms of solar forcing of geoelectric dynamics, they're doing a much better job looking at the polar cusp and seeing not only how solar wind prefers coupling there, but how the electric forcing is not confined to that system. It bleeds out to lower latitudes during increased geomagnetic activity. With a large upward field-aligned current surge, which exceeds the auroral zone, and a downward surge extending equatorward at the dusk position. It is almost as though the auroral particles integration with the lower latitudes and lower portions of the atmosphere is a direct way for solar forcing of one electric ring to spread its effects throughout the globe. Folks, that was about part one of seven needed to translate the Jovian solar forcing discovery to Earth systems. This next one is not in your link list. It's yet another one screaming how in trouble the flora and fauna of Earth are under climate change. Of course, it's a model, just like the ones that said all tiny ocean creatures were doomed, but actual observations showed they're thriving with more food to eat, krill, chlorophyll, phytoplankton. Well, turns out that's the case with many plants too. This isn't the first time the extra carbon harm hypothesis was tested on plants and failed, but it's the first time on a tree of this size. Like everything else, their models fail and actual reality shows the plant food is helping the plants, not hurting them. Shocking. Last but not least, I'm sure many of you have seen this and I'm seeing a lot of you discussing the topics online. I'm seeing one thing in the articles and in your conversations that makes me want to go looking for my white glove. Articles in your opponents will say something like, well, the rest of the world was sizzling hot and we snowflakes are melting. Who cares about Antarctica? But of course, they just say that because by comparison to much of the last few years, the last six months were not so warm globally, barely above average, and definitely not sizzling. 
We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close. Subscribe and we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now at 6 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.